Levelmatic automatically detects areas of your audio that are too quiet or too loud and adjusts them for you. Typically, fixing this sort of audio would require that you carefully keyframe your levels, fixing each loud or quiet area by hand. Levelmatic does all of this for you automatically and you can play back the results in real time. Levelmatic is easy to install and easy to use. You just apply Levelmatic and set your target level. This is the level that you want all of your audio to conform to. If you want your audio to conform very strictly to the target level you set, keep the strength knob at its default setting of 80%. If you would prefer that your audio keep more of its natural dynamics, turn the strength knob to a lower value. For a voiceover, you might keep strength at default levels or higher. While for an interview or outdoor audio recording, you might use a lower value. You can also create and share custom presets, which is very helpful if you're working in a team or need to move your project between applications. For instance, Adobe Audition and Final Cut Pro. We believe that Levelmatic is a must-have for a wide variety of video and podcasting projects, and we hope you enjoy using it. It's a common problem in podcasts and interviews. Plosive sounds. They're caused by a blast of air on the microphone, and they sound distracting and unprofessional. Pop Remover is an audio plugin that removes these plosive noises from your audio. You just drop it onto your clip and adjust the simple controls. Here's what it sounded like before Pop Remover was applied. Pitter patter, pitter patter, the twistily toenails tapped on my beating chest. And here's what it sounds like after Pop Remover has been applied to the clip. Pitter patter. Pitter patter, the twistily toenails tapped on my beating chest. Pop Remover identifies and removes each loud plosive sound automatically, so you don't need to painstakingly keyframe your audio track. Pop Remover is easy to install and easy to use. The most important control is the strength knob, which allows you to choose how much plosive noise is removed. You can also create and share custom presets, which is very helpful if you're working in a team or need to move your project between applications. For instance, Adobe Audition and Final Cut Pro. We believe that Pop Remover is the simplest and most powerful plosive removal plugin available today, and we hope you enjoy using it. If you make videos or podcasts, you've probably run into this problem before. Room Echo. You might have a great looking room and a really nice microphone, but there can still be reverb in your audio that sounds distracting. Echo Remover is a plugin that uses AI to remove echo from your audio. Just drop it onto your clip and adjust the simple controls. Here's what it sounded like before Echo Remover was applied. You probably got something that sounds a little bit like this. And here's what it sounds like after Echo Remover has been applied. You probably got something that sounds a little bit like this. It's easy to install and easy to use. The most important control is the strength knob, which allows you to choose how much echo removal is applied. There are also advanced controls. Dryness for setting how aggressive the echo removal is. Body for adding thickness to the voice. And tone for making the voice sound brighter. Any custom presets you create can be shared, which is very helpful if you're working in a team or need to move your project between applications. For instance, Adobe Premiere and Final Cut Pro. We believe that Echo Remover can completely change the way you make videos and podcasts, and we hope you enjoy using it. So your subject is wearing a lavalier microphone, and then this happens. Rustle noise. A piece of clothing brushes against the mic, and the result is distracting and hard to remove from your edit. Rustle Remover is an audio plugin that uses AI to remove these rustle noises from your audio. You just drop it onto your clip and adjust the simple controls. Here's what it sounded like before Rustle Remover was applied to the clip. And that's where we are. That is where we are. And here's what it sounds like after Rustle Remover has been applied to the clip. And that's where we are. That is where we are. Rustle Remover identifies and removes each rustle noise automatically, so you don't need to edit them out individually. Rustle Remover is easy to install and easy to use. The most important control is the strength knob, which allows you to choose how much rustle noise is removed. 
You can also create and share custom presets, which is very helpful if you're working in a team or need to move your project between applications. For instance, Adobe Audition and Final Cut Pro. We believe that Russell Remover is the simplest and most powerful Russell Removal plugin available today, and we hope you enjoy using it. For anyone who makes videos or podcasts, it's a familiar problem. Background noise. You might have a fan or air conditioner running, or maybe traffic noise from the street outside. Audio Denoise is an audio plugin that uses AI to remove this background noise from your audio. You just drop it onto your clip and adjust the simple controls. Here's what it sounded like before Audio Denoise was applied. Let's talk about good audio and how sometimes it just doesn't happen. And here's what it sounds like after Audio Denoise has been applied to the clip. Let's talk about good audio and how sometimes it just doesn't happen. The noise in this clip was a complex mixture of fan noise and 60 cycle electrical hum. Audio Denoise was able to recognize and remove both types of noise simultaneously, leaving the voice sounding great. Audio Denoise is easy to install and easy to use. The most important control is the strength knob, which allows you to choose how much noise is removed. You can also create and share custom presets, which is very helpful if you're working in a team or need to move your project between applications. For instance, Adobe Audition and Final Cut Pro. We believe that Audio Denoise is the simplest and most powerful noise removal plugin available today, and we hope you enjoy using it. When you're recording outdoors, it's something that's hard to avoid. Traffic noise. Traffic Remover is an audio plugin that uses AI to remove traffic noise from your audio. You just drop it onto your clip and adjust the simple controls. Here's what it sounded like before Traffic Remover was applied. It's a great place to live because of this all wonderful wildlife explosion. And here's what it sounds like after traffic remover has been applied to the clip. It's a great place to live because of this all wonderful wildlife explosion. Traffic remover identifies and removes the sound of automobile traffic automatically, leaving the voice sounding natural. Traffic remover is easy to install and easy to use. The most important control is the strength knob, which allows you to choose how much traffic noise is removed. You can also create and share custom presets, which is very helpful if you're working in a team or need to move your project between applications. For instance, Adobe Audition and Final Cut Pro. We believe that Traffic Remover is the simplest and most powerful traffic noise removal plugin available today, and we hope you enjoy using it. If you've ever tried to record audio outdoors, you've probably run into this problem. Wind noise. No matter what kind of microphone you're using, it doesn't take much to ruin your audio. Wind Remover is an audio plugin that uses AI to remove this wind noise from your audio. You just drop it onto your clip and adjust the simple controls. Here's what it sounded like before Wind Remover was applied. These are actually very vague, long distant relatives of Canadian redwood. And here's what it sounds like after Wind Remover was applied to the clip. These are actually very vague, long distant relatives of Canadian redwood. The wind noise in this clip was an unpredictable mix of low and high frequencies, and it would have been impossible to fix with EQ tools. Wind Remover was able to recognize and remove this wind noise automatically, leaving the voice sounding natural. Wind Remover is easy to install and easy to use. The most important control is the strength knob, which allows you to choose how much noise is removed. You can also create and share custom presets, which is very helpful if you're working in a team or need to move your project between applications. For instance, Adobe Audition and Final Cut Pro. We believe that Wind Remover is the simplest and most powerful wind noise removal plugin available today, and we hope you enjoy using it. What if I told you that the most important ingredient for any high-quality video is high-quality audio? Let's do a quick experiment. What are you more likely to watch? Good quality image, proper lighting, but audio is so bad it's tough to understand me. Or OK video that does the job, but a lovely clear sounding audio. You know the answer. Here at Voice Effects, we are thrilled to introduce you to a brand new addition to our family of tools that helps you stop worrying about your audio quality.
Crumple Pop is an AI-powered set of software filters that makes you sound great. If you're doing an interview in a less than perfect room like this, use Acro Mover and instantly things sound better. Nice. Walking down the streets, don't have to worry about the traffic noise anymore. Just add traffic remover. Now you can only hear the important things again, like me. Crumple Pop audio tools are simple enough for beginners to use. Just choose the filter you need, and most of the work is done the moment you drag the effects on. And these effects are so fast to render, you can happily use them for real-time situations like streaming or video calls. You can work with the standalone application or plug in VST and AU filters in your favorite workstation. That includes Premiere Pro, Audition, Final Cut, DaVinci Resolve, and of course, many more places. The Boris FX Crumple Pop AI audio tools are available for you to download now. Say goodbye to surprise audio problems and let people focus on the most important sounds. Try Crumple Pop for free today. Welcome to Boris FX Live. Sponsored by Dell, NVIDIA and Intel. Hello everyone and welcome to Boris FX Live with me, Ben Brownlee. Now, this is a special one today as we're going to be welcoming a new member to the Boris FX family. Crumple Pop AI audio plugins are now a part of the Boris FX offering and we're going to be talking with some of the brains behind Crumble Pop, showing you why you'll want to use these tools if you work with audio or own a pair of ears. Uh, I'll be the one driving the software today, and truth be told, uh, it's actually been one of the easiest presentations I've had to prep. Uh, the learning curve is really gentle, and basically it just works. But that, that's coming up a little bit later. Uh, even later than that, we're going to open up the discussion a bit beyond audio uh, into a larger topic. So whilst Crumble Pop are the first available Boris FX products that are powered by AI, we actually haven't been sleeping on machine learning these last many years. And I'll be bringing on Imagineer CEO, JP Smith, as well as the founder of Boris FX, uh, Boris Yaminitsky, uh, to talk about the past, present, and future of AI and machine learning within Boris FX software. Now, this is gonna be an interesting one, so you'll wanna stick around and be a part of it. And because this is Boris FX Live, we want to hear your thoughts and questions. And here's how you do it. Now, if you're watching on YouTube or BorisFXLive.com, you will see a little chat box very, very close to the viewer. Don't be shy. Uh, put all of your little questions or comments in there. And uh, all of the good questions we will read out. All of the bad questions. We'll actually also probably read out as well. So we just want to hear what you're uh, what you're thinking. Uh, there is, of course, other reasons to head over to BorisFXLive.com. And that is, of course, a chance to enter our competition with big prizes today. All you have to do is go to BorisFXLive.com, scroll to the bottom of the page and uh, enter your details in the little box there for a chance to win one of today's prizes. And we're giving away a ton of stuff. Um, we are giving away five uh, annual subscriptions to Crumple Pop, uh, which you will find is going to be absolutely invaluable to you. And of course, one annual subscription to the Boris Effect Suite. That is everything that we make, uh, including, uh, I've, you know, I've forgotten everything that we make, including Sapphire, Continuum, Silhouette, Mocha Pro, uh, Optics, and now Crumple Pop. So that's going away to one lucky winner today. So get your entries in now. Now, before we move on, I just want to say thank you to our sponsors for helping to bring this live stream kicking and screaming into the second decade of the 20th century, uh, 21st century. Uh, NVIDIA, Dell, and Intel, um, the calendar makers will be on my back for next uh, week. All right, thanks, thanks very much, obviously, to Intel, Dell, and NVIDIA, with a big shout out to Dell for their Precision 3260 Compact. I've called it an ultra small form factor workstation for the most space constrained workstations. Other people just call it Dave. So thank you very much for Dell and the Precision 3260 Compact Workstation. 
All righty. Um, let's obviously not forget that you can follow us on all of the socials. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, there's nothing to stop you from hitting that subscribe button to be the first to find out when we have anything new. And of course, also Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And if you are a, uh, a Gen Z, of course, you can also follow us on Discord. We are on Discord. Scan the code to join the discussions or just go to discord.io slash Boris effects. Um, and we are in fact a growing community. So, so be like all the cool kids, join us on discord. Uh, we're also going to be at uh, NAB coming up in uh, April 16th to the 18th. We will be uh, over at the AMD booth. So join us there Sunday, Monday and Tuesday between 10 a.m. and 12 p.m. and also 1 and 3 and you can chat with oh here we go oh Brian's popping in oh do you can chat with uh, Nick Rodriguez or Harry Frank and find out all of the new stuff that's happening get a nice little sneak peek of all of the cool things that are going on with Boris effects in 2023 I've just been told it is, in fact, 2023. All right. Um, well, let's let's bring in our first guest now. Um, it's enough of me blathering on. Oh, uh, we've actually got some of the Crumple Pop team here today to help us uh, understand what the tools are and how they came into being. So it's a joy to bring on uh, Jed Smentek, Jabe Chaffetz, Chaffetz. Oh my God, I almost got that right. And Pat Donahoe. Uh, Jed, Gabe. Patrick, welcome to Boris Effects Live. Thank you very much for making it through my intro. Hey, how's it going? Thanks, Ben. <laughs> it's, it's, well. it's, it's good to be here. Thank you. For I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad to hear. It's uh, it's it's actually it's really cool. It's it's great um, welcoming new people into the uh, into the Boris Effects family um, and having a chance to introduce you to the uh, to the greater Boris Effects community as well. Um, so I think probably the first thing is like the first question on on people's minds is is about Crumple Pop itself. You know, you you didn't just appear out of uh, of nowhere. Um, Jed, could you just give us like a, a very brief history of of uh, you know how you and and Crumple Pop uh, ended up here? Um, so it's been a long time. Sometimes hard to remember exactly how long. Uh, but uh. Gabe likes to always mention that when we first started, it was uh, long enough ago that uh, you had to render and wait. For, <laughs> uh, if, if people can remember back then, to we we would often like be repairing bikes, uh, doing video production way way back then. Um, so I would like set up a render, and then I'd maybe true a wheel or build a help build out a bicycle, and then um, you know check the render and come back and finish our editing tasks um so gabe and i got started or i gabe already had been doing video production and i came on as a eager you know, uh call it i mean i had known pat in college um and we had uh done you know video production work together as well and then i met gabe who was doing video production and then i did some stuff with him in that world doing some smaller uh like you know, commercial gigs here and there and short form documentaries was primarily why I thought Gabe was super cool and on the scene and um, internet video, maybe newspapers were going to be doing internet web video and that would be a cool world. So I, I was following Gabe around eagerly and we eventually started making um, some titles for Final Cut 6 and then that grew slowly into the form of plugins and um, fast forward many years later, uh, yeah, we are here where we are. Um, there uh, was an era where we did video plugins and audio, but we switched uh, quite a, a few years ago now to focusing on audio only. And um, around the time we started developing AI, but we'll get into that uh, later. But yeah, hopefully that exactly. Well, um, timeline. I think that's 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 very good. Um, like, I, well, I, let's let's ask this of you, Gabe. Then, like, why? Why did you make the move from video plugins to audio ones then? Um, you know, our plugins have always 
been designed to kind of just quickly and easily solve problems for video editors. And, and it's really all about kind of a, a more pleasant or at least less painful workflow. And um, as, as we interacted with more and more editors, um, this kept coming up, this issue of, of audio. And as you know, editors ourselves, uh, it was very familiar that if you're a video editor, and there's an audio problem in your project, uh, you know there's a problem, uh, but you have really no interest in in knowing enough about audio to 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 solve it. And or you know, or, or a nicer way to say it is that it it uh, it's too it's too big of a project to to attack audio problems. You just want audio problems to go away. And so we knew this from personal experience as editors. And um, it's something that we also heard about from our customers. And so for, for years, this was kind of the, the, the um, ultimate set of problems to solve for, for video editors and eventually for podcasters was audio problems. And, um, and so we started, that's, that's what led us in the, in the direction of audio. And, you know, I remember I used to, uh, probably as a bunch of us did, uh, I used to spend a lot of time on um, discussion boards for video, you know, like back in the day, like there was, um, uh, I think it's DV info was one that I was on a lot. There was a DVX user, if you were a little bit cool. Um, and I remember audio, you know, audio problems would get discussed and they would come up. And I distinctly remember, uh, you know, searching for like, ah, oh, I, like I have echo in my, in my video. Like what, is there a, a tool? Can you, can I EQ out echo? And I, I distinctly remember this, this very uh, grumpy answer from, uh, you know, so someone with, you know, like, you know 13,000 posts on the board or whatever, that was like, it is impossible to remove echo from, you know, from a video, <laughs> you know, and, and it's just like, ah, and the, you know, dismay of just like, oh no. And uh, so it's, it's very cool that like years later, now we uh, have a product that, that actually does that. And so it feels, I always think of whoever posted that, you know, uh, in the late 2000s on whatever board that was, you know. And, um, <laughs> um, so it's a, it's just a, it's a giant set of problems for editors, editor, video editors want to make audio problems go away. They don't want to yep. get into it at a high level of detail. They don't want to, um, and in many cases can't, I mean, there's a whole class of problems like reverb or like wind where you, you can't EQ them away. You can't use compressors and limiters, typical tools. Um, so that, that's really what led us into, into audio was, can we solve these sorts of problems for this editor? And, and that we know very well. Well, that, I mean, that, that's it. Like when, when I'm, I'm teaching, or when I was, was teaching, you know, audio for video editors, like the the two things that you'd be asked all the time is like uh how how do i make this louder uh how do i make this sound better um you know and that that's as that's as sort of technical um <laughs> as as people would be able to get it's like you know is, do we have a make it make it better button um and for a long time like there, there wasn't really you you just had yeah grumpy people on on forums saying no you've got to re-record it um but we'll, we'll, we'll get in and actually have a look at how we've got, um, you know, make it better buttons now, which is, which is actually very exciting. Um, I want to, want to bring like, uh, Pat in here, like, can, can you tell us a little bit about, about your, your history then? And, uh, you know, where, where you, where you sit in the, uh, in the company. Sure. So at the beginning, uh, Jed and Gabe started the company and then, uh, I was still in college, Jed and I, uh, did production work in college together and uh, made music together as well for years. And so when I graduated from college, I jumped in and started doing stuff with Crumple Pop as well. Um, and kind of a little bit of everything being the team that we are. And so once we kind of shifted to kind of figuring out what we wanted to do, um, just like looking for problems in video, since both Jed and I came from kind of a music background, we saw more of the tools that you could use in like audio production that seemed 
not very around for video. Um, and just kind of thinking through like, oh, if there was an easy way to EQ, if there was an easy way to remove noise, if there was any of those that we could just make knowing the video user does not want to do it. Like uh, in a post like DSLR world, focusing on like beautiful images is a lot more fun. I think for most video people, while focusing on audio can feel like, oh, am I doing more damage to it? Is it too distracting? And just kind of takes more work to get to a place where you like it uh, and might be a little less fun. So to us, it was just trying to find a way to kind of introduce some of those tools, but in a way that like a video person might think about them. Uh, and a lot of that was kind of simplifying stuff to the least amount of controls as possible uh, and, and making sure it just kind of could work with as much audio as it could, whether that's a file format or different types. And so over time, I kind of just got into that flow as well. And uh, I've helped out with marketing and all of that moving forward too. So that's about when I jumped in. You know, uh, this is a perfect opportunity to talk about um, uh, an early uh, a project that the three of us worked on that uh, I was hoping to bring up because it's it's sort of embarrassing. Um, this was this was in uh, 2010 when we were still just getting started. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we were still just getting started with uh, you know the video plugins business, and it was very new and. We were, so we were still doing uh, video production uh, gigs, basically jobs. And um, so we got hired by a, uh, a gardening club here in Minneapolis to make an instructional video about um, how to build a, uh, a hoop house, like a, a type of greenhouse. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was like a volunteer project to build this, this cool kind of... Uh, greenhouse structure and, you know, people would come together and work on it. And this was in 2010. So there's this idea of, you know, maybe we need to grow our own food and all these sorts of ideas. So we were there and, um, and we were, this is a great example of how a small team would, you know, record audio kind of on the run. We had the um, mic mounted on the camera. Um, I don't even think we had, do we have lavalier mics on that project at all? I, no. I don't think so. Right, so we had a couple cameras on camera mics. We were running there around. There were some lab. Yeah, there were maybe a couple lab shoots separately, but yeah, yeah. And, um, and so this is over a two day period, and um, the thing is getting built. And on the second day, we noticed that the the group was getting smaller and smaller as as <laughs> volunteers kind of uh, started. You know, like people would go on with their day and go on to the next thing. And eventually, uh, it was just us, the video crew, and the guy who was running this thing. Mm -hmm. And he's kind of looking at us like, you guys, we got a couple hours before the sun goes down. If, if uh, we're going to finish this, uh, I would need your help. So we, <laughs> the, 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 we had to actually kind of try to shoot it and work on building it. We ended up helping finish building this thing. Um, and so we've, that's been a notorious project over the years that we've called a hoop house, but it's a great example of how um, sometimes you don't get uh, ideal audio. And that can be if you're an editor and something winds up on your desk and it hasn't, you know, it has, oh, these were three guys who were had on-camera mics and were operating power drills sort of at the same time. Uh, okay, this is going to be a problem. And um and that was, we kind of saw that as a, it was not an ideal uh, scenario to, to record audio in, but that's the kind of thing that helped us kind of years later, we would say like, oh, you know, we would even dig up these files from projects from five years ago, 10 years ago and say, okay, you know, could we fix Hoop House? Like would be like a question, could we fix... <laughs> Could we fix uh, the video where we, you know, that was about beekeepers? Could we go, you know, all these little projects we had done uh, ended up being super helpful because we knew, we knew firsthand that, you know, what sort of problems, audio problems that uh, editors wind up having to fix. And at the end of the day, the client doesn't care that the editor or the video editor isn't an audio person. They just want it to look good and sound good. And they say, oh, could mm -hmm. you, could you just remove that sound there, please? You know, so 
that was a, a kind of connects our our early days to to I think the uh, the audio tools. Well, that's it. I think um, like speaking from from personal experience as as well. You know, in in the early days when I was doing a lot of run and gun stuff, like audio would be what what you could get. I actually remember uh, you know traveling around with uh, an assistant carrying like tens of pounds worth of uh, of this really heavy uh, material that we could try to put up into a into a room and try and treat the room like any sort of office from horrible echo and reverb and did it work uh, it, it may be maybe a little bit better uh, but it you know it certainly gave uh, gave the assistant um a lot of a lot of heavy uh, heavy lifting to do um so they're they're properly yoked now um so you know that, they should definitely thank me for that um, but i mean that it, it really is like video video people need to think about audio because it's it's one of those it's one of those things that bad bad audio is is sort of the first thing that people hear like you can you can do a lot of fun little editing tricks uh to try and hide uh, bad looking video, but bad looking audio is is always going to be directly in your face or you know directly in your ears. Um, I mean let let's 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 get back to 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 the plugins a little bit then, and um, you know, Jed, like I, I mentioned in the intro that these audio plugins are AI powered. Um, you know, what what actually does that mean in the in the context of a of an audio filter? So. The simplest way to break it down, I would say, is to say that, you know, machine learning, AI, whatever you choose to call it, has been um, taught that what voices and what or like signal, if we're going to use, you know, the video production terms, right, signal versus noise, what's signal, so in this case, the voice, um, and then what's noise, and it does a very good job at that. And then with any kind of, you know, tool, you're going to need um, a little bit of that extra help that 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 tool needs. And that's kind of where the customizations come in. And like Pat was saying earlier, as few controls as possible, but like also powerful tools that kind of do a lot at once, you know, so the AI is able to really get it there. And then you can kind of fine tune how much noise removal you'll need um, or you know, in, in something like echo removal, there's slightly different things going on there because echo has a lot more, um, I guess for lack of a better term, psychoacoustics of like where, how the voice sounds. Like you may have a big space, you remove the echo, it sounds a little strange. So you need to fine tune a few things to get it exactly where you want it to keep it as natural as possible. Um, so yeah, so in short, the AI has learned what's noise and what's voice. And um, we've built tools that um, kind of help the AI uh, deliver a result that um, sounds natural and removes the noise as, as good as possible. Well, I, th I think that we, we, like all of you have talked about it in, in some sort of way now, but like when it comes to actually designing these, these plugins, like, uh, you know, not just the function, the functionality of them, but actually the usability, the user experience of, of how these work, you know, what, what is important about designing a, uh, an audio plugin for the, you know, maybe the, the, the less technical audio person or someone who doesn't want to have to, uh, you know, go down and, and read like a super thick manual. I mean, what, yeah. what's the, what's the process there? I think that related to what I was just talking about is that when I said what's noise and what's voice, well, like what is noise? Like that is the part where you get into what you're talking about, which is like, say you're going to use a conventional, uh, you know, an old school, even a 1940s way of removing noise. You're going to have to understand what the noise is. And that in itself, some people don't have time for that. They have to deliver a project today and they need it gone. They don't need to, they don't want to learn what type of noise that even is. And so we have these different tools, which is like something like wind, which is actually a cacophony of a variety of type of noise or traffic 
another great example of we've given it that name. People know that name. You know, you know it when you hear it. That's traffic noise. Well, actually, it's quite complicated what makes up traffic noise. So we've done a lot of that work in our training of the AI so that the user doesn't have to really know. They can just drag on traffic remover. Oh, it worked. Or wind remover. Oh, it worked. And um, rather than spending time uh, doing those things or using some kind of all-encompassing noise removal tool, which isn't going to do as targeted the job. So by the nature of how we've crafted it with that user in mind is that we've done something where we're trying to both give a somewhat broad idea of what a noise is, echo, wind, traffic, uh, rustle, uh, pops. Those are all kind of broad categories when you start to get technical, um, but the user understands them. And then uh, we just deliver a result that can um, clean up a lot of variety within that category, if that makes sense. So not one giant, uh, you know, jack of all trades, master of none, but a, a kind of individual plugins that are made for each uh, genre, if you will, of noise. Mm. Um, and, and yeah. There, I think there's another um, um, aspect to this too, as it relates to the uh, the design of it and, and, and how we've uh, put the plugins together. And it also goes back to, I think the early days when we worked together as a team Jed mentioned that, you know, while we were waiting for renders to finish, we would be working on uh, bicycles, you know, so we had half of the half of our, our office space was editing stations and half of it was basically, uh, you know, bicycle repair tools and kind of piled here and there. And we, we started out when we started out, all of us were actively working on uh, building and, and kind of fixing up single speed bicycles. And Jed was uh, had extensive experience of, of of putting together these these bikes, like basically using like trash that he'd found on the street almost. <laughs> uh, and it was a, as, so we'd be working on this while we were you know working on uh, video editing and plugin design and all of this stuff. And uh, the essence of uh, of a how how you put together like a single speed bike is it's not fancy, but it's it's stripped down to the simplest possible. Uh, design the fewest possible parts and there's a big there's a pride in that and you know you you remove everything except for what you absolutely need and you and you create something that's very simple and it's it's uh easy to maintain it's not much can go wrong and if you look at then our approach to uh the audio plugins uh, it's, it's actually very similar and i think it's it's been influenced by that kind of uh approach to design which is you get rid of as much as you possibly can and you create uh, the simplest possible mechanism. And um, so the less can go wrong. And so if you look at uh, a plugin, you know, a plugin echo remover, the name is, it sounds almost ridiculous. You know, it's, it's so simple, it, but it communicates this one area of functionality. It's very simple. It has uh, a big knob. And that's kind of all you need to know. And then it just does one thing and it does it well. And so that, I think that approach to design and to usability has carried through from the early days to, to these audio plugins. And I think that's uh, been a big value to video editors because the, again, the video editor, they want something that is, it's simple, it does the job and they can use it and the problem is fixed and they can move on with their project. So I, I that just want to tie that another piece of the kind of the history of the of the group into how that's um, how that's really influenced the design of these plugins. Yeah, I, no. to tag to tag in another analogy on there because I love we speak in analogies a lot at, at, uh, at Crumble Pop, but we also building something for a pro in mind can take that single speed and rather than us choosing for them to make it a ten speed or. A, a 12 speed or whatever various derailleur or other uh, pieces of the gear ratio figure that we give something to them so that if they have specific goals in mind with the audio on I'm saying like a pro user regular people if the bike works and it's beautiful and it's serviceable pros want to add different things we have something there that is non-destructive and works functionally for that pro so that, that that's a, that cleanliness if you will of the signal it keeping it intact and as pure as possible is also something to keep in mind for the, the pro users so they can choose they can still use it in their workflows as uh, that that they use every day 
Well, I mean, this is what I was I was going to say. We're get, we're actually going to have a look at that in in just a uh, just a few minutes. But you know, there there are going to be because these tools are are rather focused. Um, you know, you any and you do have quite a bit of flexibility within the specific areas. Is is there actually a, a specific kind of order of operations if you've got like a particularly troublesome clip that's got a lot of echo and a fair amount of noise is is there a specific um you know a specific order you should apply those effects in or you know is is it a lot less sensitive because it is so is so focused like that that's still a subtle art i would say that plugin chain um is going to change what depending on what your goal is but generally speaking there's the normal kind of rules that would apply um which is if you can do something with as few pieces as possible, that's always best. You know, you're going to want to, um, generally speaking, I would say if you have a specific noise, you might want to use audio denoise alongside it or a traffic remover alongside it. I would say traffic removers, very good at outdoor noises. You'd be surprised. You may be able to remove, like, for example, wind, you may put wind remover on and wind remover may do such a good job. You may actually not have known that there were like some trees rustling as well um, or like grasses making a strange noise. And you may need traffic remover actually maybe do quite well at removing that rustle as well. Um, that tree noise, which is not something you're used to hearing um, mm -hmm. on its own. But um, that would be a good example of like two things together, wind remover and traffic remover, or perhaps a classic duo would be echo remover and audio denoise. I think when you're talking about the non-pro user, Typically, what happens is the reason they have noise is that they've recorded too low or they weren't able to monitor levels because they were operating the camera. Um, and so something like audio denoise or traffic remover being used alongside any of the other tools is something I think um, that would be quite common. Um, if you want a specific list uh, in our FAQ, um, I, I could pull it up right now if you want, but uh, there is a um, in the Boris uh support articles that I put a, um, something up there because um, sometimes we get that question from people, just our opinion on the plugin chain order. You know, yeah. and one, one nice, one nice thing about um, coming up with the, you know, a good order for how to stack the plugins is uh, it's really easy to experiment because uh, they play back uh, in real time, right? So you can drag and drop one on, hit the space bar and you're hearing the end result. So you can very quickly flip-flop the order, play back, hit, listen, change it, you know, and that like really, I think allows mm -hmm. kind of rapid experimentation with these plugins. And uh, I, I, it's a big benefit of them uh, being uh, good in terms of the speed of, you know, performance is that you can, you can quickly kind of make mistakes and then figure out something that sounds good in terms of the order. Yeah. yeah. You can definitely like follow normal audio production rules on it and and get a good result. Like, oh, do the the audio levels at the end and make sure that the voice is you know the color that you want and the sound that you want, and then deal with the levels with Levelmatic afterwards. But yeah, the experimentation is often you can find a result that is just as good, if not better, uh, being able to quickly adjust and and trying different orders just to see what sounds best to you. If we are on this topic, uh, something I would advise as well is to make sure if you have a very quiet clip um, ever that you have brought that up, um, you know, up to, when you apply a plug into it, you want to be able to help the AI distinguish between noise and voice. And of course, it's going to work better if, it, you know, if I'm talking about very, very quiet audio, you know, you there's um that's something you're always going to want to make sure, because I feel like if we're talking to basic users, just like remember to monitor properly, like wear headphones or have good speakers and remember to, um, you know, like have the level loud enough to look at the level meter and make sure yep. it's, you know, proper. And like, you'd be surprised, like some video people don't have time to learn, to learn that, you know, it's just like, what a difference um, proper monitoring in the form of headphones or other things can, can do just to help your workflow. Some, cool. some yeah, sort of condescending, a, but <laughs> no. As a as a video editor, I I thought I was being pretty fancy if I was adjusting levels. I thought that was like okay. I'm I'm really <laughs> I'm in the audio now. Like oh, I would you know oh wait let me let me raise it a little bit. Like that was my that was my <laughs> as a video editor that was my understanding. Right. Well, 
what we're going to do then, guys, is we're, we're going to take a, uh, a little bit of a break now. And when we come back, we are going to start to see and, well, more importantly, listen to some of the things that we've been uh, talking about here. So, uh, yeah, Jed, Gabe, Pat, hang around. Um, you know, we're, we're going to come back a little bit later. Um, you're watching Boris Effect Live. Uh, my name is Ben Brownlee, and we are talking audio today. So we are going to be uh, looking at the Crumple Pop uh, set of AI-powered audio plugins. Now, if you are watching and enjoying what you're seeing on YouTube, don't forget to give us a little thumbs up button. It costs you nothing and it helps us out a ton. If you're watching on BorisFXLive.com, you might have been tempted to go down to the bottom of the screen to enter our competition. And you are very wise to do so because we are going to be giving away some prizes right now. So today we're going to be giving away a total of five annual subscriptions to the Crumble Pop uh, audio plugins. And we are going to be giving away one to one lucky winner, one one year subscription to the Boris FX suite. That is everything that we make, including Crumble Pop, of course, and Sapphire, Mocha Pro, Continuum, Silhouette and Optics. It's a very, very long list now. All right, so let's give away some stuff. Mission Control, are we ready to give away some stuff? I'm, 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 I'm getting a, I'm getting a thumbs up in my ear. Right, let's, let's, let's do it. All right, so let's go and roll that big giant tombola and see who the first lucky winner is going to be. All right. Our first lucky winner is Dan Ryman. Dan, congratulations. You have won a one-year subscription to Crumple Pop. You are a first winner of the day. Congratulations to Dan. Uh, let's see, do we have another winner? Or are we holding on? Let's, let's hold on with that one. We have got plenty of time still uh, to go to uh, borisfexlive.com and to check out uh, the uh, the little form at the bottom of the page. All right, but let's do what everyone has been waiting for. Let's actually look at some of these effects. All right, let's uh, switch over. I'm going to start in uh, Resolve, but I'm going to be looking at uh, the same effect in lots of different effects. Uh, sorry, lots of different applications. So let's roll on. If you can see, my screen. All righty. Okay, so we should be here and we should be able to hear our first clip. If we play this back, well, we might not be able to play. There we go. Very vague of Canadian Redwood. Pitter patter. So let's play that back again. These are actually very vague, long, distant relatives of Canadian redwood. These are these are actually very distant re relatives of the Canadian redwood. I think that's a lie, but what I do hear is a lot of of wind in there. All right, so this is this is one of the classics. This is um, you know, we're out out in nature, and we've got a microphone exposed or not exposed we're still picking up a bit of wind here actually very vague and you can you can see that wind in the waveform here it's that that horrible uh very vague spiky spiky waveform that's going through a couple of different areas here Canadian redwood. oh now wind is is actually a little bit tricky or has uh, i was gonna say historically been a bit tricky to eq out you know because it does affect lots of different uh frequencies here but I'm going to show you something fun. There's a plugin. It's called Wind Remover. I'm going to drag it over the top here. And this is the sort of standard layout um, that that we've got to uh, to to look at the uh, the Crumple Pop uh, audio plugins. Basically, there's a big knob in the middle which can uh, you know changes our strength. So let's let's see what it's like just 
at the standard default volume or standard default uh, level. These are actually very vague, long, distant relatives of Canadian redwood. Pitter and so that's a little, that's a, well, a little bit better. It's a lot better, but it's still a little bit of wind in there. It's actually very vague. You still hear it here. So basically, all you're going to do is you're going to turn the strength up. It's going to have a little think. These are actually like, very vague. Long like the tiniest amount of thought. These are actually very vague, long, distant relatives of... And I just turn it up. Redwood. And that... These are actually very vague, long, distant relatives of canadian redwood These are there we go wind is gone now if you wanted to you could start fiddling about with some more of the other you know the output here or checking out for the low mids and highs i'm not going to do any of that i fixed my problem i don't need to do anything so you know i'm just going to move on to my next shot job done happy i can forget about wind forever um and one, I'm just just uh, scanning one of the comments in the chat. Uh, a zoom with no wind uh, windscreen, classic. Uh, yes, <laughs> absolutely. Yes, it really is a classic. Uh, we love it. Um, we got another little example here. Let's uh, let's get rid of this one here. Uh, and our second example is a uh, well. Let's let's hear it. See if you can. Pitter patter. Have a little listen. Pitter patter. The twistily toenails tap on my beating chest hmm okay anyone anyone notice what's what's going on there Pitter yeah we've got a little bit of pop Pitter -patter, the twistily toenails tapped on my beating chest so there's a couple of different things we've, we've got like there's a little bit of, of room noise in there as well a little bit of stuff in the background but the biggest problem is obviously the the pops pa, 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 pa. and like resolve like um like a lot of the hosts actually now have certain things built into them uh to be able to sort of try and help out with some of some of these things um if we turn on voice isolation here let's turn on let's let's we're going to need to to let it think for a little while there we go and let's let's play this through pitter patter pitter patter the twistily toenails tapped on my beating chest pitter patter I thought I had it there for the first bit. I thought, oh, it's done the job. But no, no, a lot of those pops are still there. So bye bye voice isolation. Let's uh, come over to another trusty friend with my little uh, pop remover. You know, it's another plugin that, that does exactly what it says. I'm going to drag it over. It's called pop remover. We're going to be very familiar with, the, uh, with this UI. Uh, by by the end of uh, the, the next few minutes because they're very similar. We've got the strength, it's set to 80. We've got the output over here. We've got knobs down at the bottom. I'm not touching them. I'm just going to place back. Pitter patter, pitter patter, the twistily toenails tapped on my beating chest. We're still getting a little, the, like a lot of the pops are gone, but let's see what happens if we, we take this up. Maybe we can get rid of those nasty Pitter patter, pitter patter, the twistily toenails tapped on my beating chest. We got rid of most of them. There's just that one stubborn fella still there. Pitter patter, pitter patter, the twistily toenails tapped on my beating chest. Pitter patter. Let's take it all the way up. And I can come in here. Pitter patter, pitter patter, the twistily toenails tapped Ooh, on my beating there we chest. Go. Pitter patter. It's gone again. Now, if at any time we think we're taking out like a little bit too much uh, of the original sound to try and, you know, to try and try and get rid of it, like we can actually use these um, knobs down at the bottom to, to bring back in selectively some of the, the low frequencies, the mid range frequencies and the high frequencies as well. We don't need to do it so much on this one, but just remember that in, uh, in a couple of minutes time. Alrighty. So one thing that I, I forgot to say, which I think is probably a bit important, you know, these, these plugins are uh, available as uh, VST uh, and AU plugins as well. Um, so if your system supports VST three, uh, you should be, you should be good to go. We do have a compatibility chart online, but you know, we, we should be good to go. 
So if I hop over now to, well, let's, let's hop over to Premiere for a second. Uh, we'll take, what's the next one going to be? Level, level Matic. There we go. Let's, let's have a little look here. Let's come in and I'll, I'll, I'll just come in and expand out this. If I can find, find my little thing here, maybe I've got a little, uh, let's make it bigger. There we go, Ben. There we go. All right. So you can see that a little bit easier now. Let's have a little listen to this. Ted Hall basketball coming at you. Let me let you in on a little secret. It's called the step back three. Come back here, shoot, score. Okay. Ted Hall basketball coming at you. Let me let you in on a little secret. It's called the step back three. Come back here, shoot, score. Perfect. Someone who loves to play with a microphone a little bit like this, but <laughs> Unfortunately, when we uh, when we come to it at, at the end of it, it's going to be a little bit tricky to to try to level these out. Now, normally, normally, the old way of doing this would be to hand you know hand painstakingly that's the word uh, come in and either you know split these clips up into the different sections or automate. The uh, you know ride the audio levels, automate the audio levels, and and you know do that all by hand, and it would be uh, what's what's the opposite of fun? Uh, unfun, yeah, that's that's the word. Um, so instead, what we're going to do is let's come in and I'm just going to go with uh, crumple pop. Actually, I'm going to go leveler, and let's have a look at our audio effects. And realize that uh, I have got these in here. By the way, this is our friend Ted Hall, who is talking about basketball here and also got us all into a, a rec basketball league. So there's more to this <laughs> clip. There's more to this clip than meets the eye. He also he took it upon himself to uh, to be our kind of coach. Uh, and he's a very good coach. And so he he has many times told us how to do a step back three in real life or all sorts of other things. <laughs> no, were you, were you finding that the plugins weren't in Premiere because did you no. use the audio plugin manager? I, I did. I did use the audio plugin manager. It, it's actually, they are actually in there, but I've got, so, I've got uh. some other stuff in there that I'm, uh, I'm not allowed to show. So we're going to head into uh, oh. audition in a little bit. Um, but I'm going to come back to to Resolve here, and and actually I did want to uh, I did want to show this clip in Resolve, because Resolve also has a a dialogue leveler, um, which kind of comes in and let's let's have a listen to this. Like this is like lift soft whispery sources. This is this is what we can do directly within Resolve. Ted Hall basketball coming at you. Let me let you in on a little secret. It's called the step back three. Come back here, shoot, score. I mean, it's better, it's better, and we can start to fiddle about, but we have to start fiddling about. Um, I'm just going to come in, I'm going to use uh, Levelmatic and push this in. And literally, the only thing we have to do on this one is decide what our target uh, level is going to be. So if I wanted this to be, you know, minus six, it's going to be pretty loud. I'm just going to uh, do this one slider to, to level six. Basketball, come and then you. we're going to play it back. There we go. And let's play it back properly. Come back here. Shoot. Score. Basketball, come on. Let me let you in on a little secret. It's called the step back three. Come back here. Shoot. Score. And that's sounding Basketball, quite nice. On. Let me let you in on a I've got, <clears throat> like, maybe there's a little bit of, uh, of weirdness going on because... I was having some problems with my uh, my audio card earlier. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to cache this audio effect uh, just so we can like hear this back. And you can see that it takes no time at all to, to cache back in. Ted Hall basketball coming at you. Let me let you in on a little secret. It's called the step back three. Come back here. Shoot. Score. Ted Hall. Boom. 
there we go so that's the step back three um the nice thing about this as well is that like if we do want to have this like hitting the um hitting our target level as much as possible you just you just twiddle the uh, the big knob again like that's 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 basically it like if you want to have it so that we keep some of the dynamic still we just turn that strength down a little bit so if you're doing like voiceover stuff and someone's stepping back here and then coming back here and then moving around and doing all of that stuff you know keep your strength up pretty high 80 percent is usually actually I, I found to be a pretty good um good starting place um but if you've got something where you want to talk well like maybe you've got like a I know like an interview or something and someone's getting a little bit quiet because they're talking about something that's a bit sort of uh dramatic and maybe maybe a bit sad uh just just keep that level level down a little bit and you'll still get the uh the, the nice little dynamics happening within the um uh within the scene there uh so that's that's all very cool um for this next one i'm actually going to pop into audition here it's it's again vst plugins so it's going to run where you're going to run uh, VST three here. Um, let's have a have a wee little look over in here. Uh, yeah. If you've seen our uh, the Crumble Pop uh, you know, launch launch video with our own uh, uh, Elizabeth, then you'll have seen quite a lot of uh, of this stuff. But we've got some behind the scenes stuff. So this is actually the raw the raw recordings. If you're doing an interview in a less than perfect room like this, use echo remover and instantly thing sounds better. That's nice. All right, so that's a little bit echoey and we can see the room in, actually you probably can't see the room in the bottom left hand corner because that happens to be where I am. But let's have a little look. This is what the room looks like. This is like your, your sort of typical uh, kind of untreated photo studio. Um, there's nothing but, uh, you know, very, very hard, flat uh, surfaces that are just bouncing the audio all the way off. And it's, it's uh, a real, uh, a real fun time there. Like this is, this is where, you know, normally I would, uh, you know, rock up with, uh, you know, 200 kilos worth of, uh, of soft furnishings and try to treat the place but we don't have to do that we can save my uh, my assistants back now and let's just have a little look here because i want to show you this this is this is one of the uh, the effects that actually it's really interesting to to look not just at the waveform here but the um like the the frequency uh you know the frequency analysis here as well uh so the the spectral frequency that's the word i'm looking for because you can actually see with all of those those big heavy areas that you have this sort of tail dropping off and that tail that's dropping off guess what that is i mean that's that's the echo so if we play this back again if you're doing an interview in a less than perfect room like this you boom boom right, i'm gonna hit just hit those claps one more time and you can see that clap here let's play that back that hits and then you've got the echo just trailing off so what i'm going to do is i'm going to bring in one of my little filters guess what we've got tons of echo guess what i'm going to use hmm maybe this big one here that says echo remover i think that's probably a good place to start um and this is cool let's let's just play this back i'm going to play this back just on the first little bit here if you're doing an interview in a less than perfect room like this, if you So, I'm not even going to touch the strength there. I'm just going to play this back one more time. Doing an interview in a less than perfect room like this. If you're doing an interview in a less than perfect room like this. Still a little bit of echo in there. And that's where we're going to come down to our, our twiddly knobs at the bottom. So we have these three knobs here. Um, up till now, we've seen them be uh, low, mid, and uh, high, but we uh, we have dryness, body, and tone. So these these are affecting something slightly different here with the uh, with the echo remover. I'm going to turn my dryness 
all the way up to 100%. And let's have a little listen. If you turn an interview in a less than perfect room like this. That's taken it a little bit too far. That's, that's, that's uh, you know, starting to really affect our, our audio. But you can, you can start to hear what that dryness function is doing. That's, that's sort of. If you turn an interview in a less than perfect room like this. If you turn an interview in a less than perfect room like this. If you turn an interview in a less than perfect room like this. If you turn an interview in a less than perfect room like this. So you start to see, like, we can start to fiddle about just with a couple of, uh, a couple of uh, knobs, a couple of controls, and things are really starting to sound a bit better. So let's, let's turn this off temporarily. If you turn an interview in a less than perfect room like this. Okay, and turn it back on. If you turn an interview in a less than perfect room like this. And now I'm going to process this out and I want you to, to take a little look at this area here. Remember the tails, remember the trails. So let's, uh, let's apply this and let's compare and contrast. Let's uh, turn that off. Thank you very much. Yeah. Let's compare and contrast the tails that we get on the bit that we just treated to the claps that we have over here. So you can see all of these, this sort of nice, clear uh, frequency here. And then we've still got all the tails and the trails happening here. So let's, let's play this back, the whole thing. We can hear this here. If you do an interview in a less than perfect room like this, use echo remover and instantly thing sounds better. That's nice. So I think that's, that's uh, you know, quite uh, an easy way of, uh, of seeing the difference between that um you know maybe we can we can start to pull this back a little bit but you know that's that's kind of nice of where we're where we're going where we're heading let's pop back i've got i'm going to do one more shot uh, i think and then I'll, I'll take a look to see if we've got any questions and we'll we'll have a little look there walking down the streets you don't have to worry about the traffic noise anymore just add traffic remover now you can only hear the important things again like me Okay, classic. This is a classic one as well. Uh, noise, not just any old noise, traffic noise. So this is something if we, if we have a look here again at the frequencies, we've got uh, a lot of noise covering a lot of different frequencies here. So it's something that is, is quite tricky just to, to EQ out. Uh, so if i come over and let's uh well let's let's apply my effect i've just been told as well that no one is seeing my cursor so when i'm saying here and here no one's seeing my cursor uh, apologies for that i will uh be on the, the hunt for my cursor again a little bit later i i didn't realize we were having cursor problems uh, so let's let's come into uh traffic remover and again i'm not going to touch anything here i'm just going to keep it back with the uh, the default levels just to remind you what we were dealing with. Walking down the streets, you don't have to worry about the traffic noise anymore. Just add traffic remover. Okay, so let's turn our traffic remover on. Have a little listen back. Walking down the streets, you don't have to worry about the traffic noise anymore. Just add traffic remover. Now you can only hear the important things again. Like so that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Let's crank it all the way up. Okay, I'm going to take us to 100%. And I'm not expecting this to sound great because we've taken it up to 100%. So, walking down the streets, don't have to worry about the traffic noise anymore. Just add traffic. So, this is taking it far too far. So, we know that there's a place, there's a value between 80 and 100 where this is going to be good. All right, so let's go into around about 90. And I'm looking for something or, or listening out for something specific here walking down the streets don't have to worry about the traffic noise anymore and what Just i'm trying to do remover. is i'm trying to take out that low brrr, the low brrr that we get from the traffic and that's happening around about 95. walking down the streets don't have to worry about the traffic noise anymore just add traffic removal. now we've got rid of that that sort of low hum that's going through 
the problem is we're taking out some of the uh some of the bits i want to keep in we're taking in some of the voice now as well and that's where these three knobs come in so uh what i could do well i want to want to keep my lows at 100 percent and maybe I want to just dial back the stuff in the highs. Well, let's, let's take that all the way down to zero so you can hear exactly what it's doing. Walking down the streets, don't have to worry about the traffic noise anymore. Just add traffic removal. So this is now not affecting those, those higher frequencies uh, at all. And if I play this through, I'm just going to scrub the, uh, the value up. I'm going to turn, turn the knob and we're going to hear it. And at some point, this is going to sound really good. It's going to sound exactly how we want it to. Walking down the streets, don't have to worry about the traffic noise anymore. Just add traffic removal. Now you can only hear the important things again. And so again, we're going to do the same sort of thing with the, with the mids as well. Walking down the streets, don't have to worry about the traffic noise anymore. Just add traffic removal. Now you can only hear the important things just... again, like me. And we can just hear those cars just just kind of disappearing out. Walking down the streets, you don't have to worry about the traffic noise anymore. Just add traffic removal. Now you can only hear the important things again, like me. Walking and there's there's actually you know we could start stacking these up a little bit. Maybe you know maybe we'll come in and we'll add in something else. We'll we'll do like another audio denoise, or we'll do like a. Um, uh, even like an echo remover, maybe. But let's try an, another audio denoise stacked on top. Walking down the streets, don't have to worry about the traffic noise anymore. Just add traffic removal. And at this now point, the... it's really, really, really easy to kind of just get a really crunchy and horrible sound. So... Again, like me. Walking down the streets, don't have to worry about the traffic noise anymore. So you can hear Just the difference removal. between... Oh, let's turn me off for a second. So you can hear the difference. If I take the traffic remover down and the audio remover up, like you're, you're not... Like those, those are, are tuned to different things. So the traffic remover is actually, surprisingly enough, better suited for removing that kind of uh, traffic rumble than just the, uh, the, the audio denoise on this, this particular clip. Now you can only hear the important things again, like me. But you don't want to go too far with it. So if I just process that, this out, I know we're, we're not quite at the right, uh, quite exactly where we want to be with this here, but we've, we've got it in a, a sort of fairly decent place. Let's just apply that. Just so you can see again the difference between like this is the this is the before. See all of that noise that's going all the way through, and that's the after. This is cleaned up like so much stuff here. Noise anymore? Just add traffic removal. Now you can. And we've still got some of the noise here. So I've got I've got a question that's just come through in chat. Um, Someone said that I usually record birds in, uh, in wildlife. Do you think this app would be useful to polish those recordings done with my iPhone? Um, actually, this is a, uh, quite a fun, a fun little, uh, fun little question. I'm going to throw it over to the, uh, the crumple pop, uh, uh, chaps first, and then I'll, I'll, I'll talk about my own little, um, my own little experience with it as well. So, uh, crumple pop chaps. What do you say? Sorry, what was the question exactly? Uh, if you're recording birds in wildlife, is the is the audio is the noise reduction uh, only tuned to, um, to to human voices, or are we able to to start to just take out general sorts of noise from uh, from the desired signal? Um, I would say that's an interesting experiment. And I uh, even something like uh, a topic of what is a bird voice is kind of a funny, uh, like birds themselves have quite a variety of uh, voice. So I would say we haven't specifically trained for the bird voice, but um, with a lot of these tools, for example, the traffic remover tool you were just using, um, Something like a bird, you may want some of that natural uh, background, you know, and something like traffic, for example, you, you might not want a full studio muffled sound. You may want 
um, to set the scene, if you will. And so um, I would say if you're setting the bird, like you're removing some other noises and you're trying to like highlight the bird noise, I feel more comfortable we could 100% do that. If you're trying to use our software to isolate bird voice, I would say that would depend on the bird. Um, and what, I'd be what if the bird, what if the bird sounded a lot like a person? Yeah, parrots. Uh, prop, yeah. That's like funny. I bet you parrots do sound better than um, that, you know, because uh, yeah, like something like traffic remover may actually remove some bird noises. That would be curious. That's a fun experiment. Um, actually, that's a fun. Um, yeah. Um, but I would say, yeah, it's designed for human voice, not for animal or bird voice. But first is like, yes, that is the truth. However, uh, I would be curious to see, like, you know, I wouldn't rule it out as a possibility. Something like wind remover, for example, um, or traffic remover may be able to help you, but not fully isolate the bird. That would be my question. I'm going to say, like, my 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 first experience with Crumple Pop was me just just trying to kind of just to see what I could do, see see if I could uh, you know get it to to fall over um with with some some things so i i just went out uh walking i i, I mic'd myself up with like four different microphones i looked like a uh an absolute crazy person which is which is pretty good um and i just i just walked around and there was uh this this one little section that i was i was in um and all i could hear when i was i was walking in there was this sort of distant sort of traffic rumbling all the way through and then you had you know just just other sort of wind coming in and, and hitting like it was it was not it was not a great day for uh, mm -hmm. for weather um and i took it back and i was i just sort of uh put on the uh the wind remover uh and the the, the traffic remover and all of a sudden i actually did hear like lots of lots of other bits bits of wildlife popping out that i hadn't heard before because it was just being being masked out by this this other sort of noise but you know i wouldn't i wouldn't have used it to isolate that particular bird yeah but i think it was really interesting that underneath all of this other you know this low rumble of of um you know environmental noise that you could actually hear like the, the greater world just suddenly revealing itself. It was, um, mm -hmm. that was quite, it was quite a lovely little moment for me can, sat in my studio. <laughs> I can think of a moment where we uh, recorded an interview with someone who was in their garage and the garage was fully open and it was a windy day. And so wind would kind of just go through the garage and you could kind of hear just this low rumble. And we're trying to clean it up and I did run it through wind remover and same thing birds that I didn't necessarily hear before all of a sudden appeared a lot louder in the mix than they had before just from removing the rumble. The wind could just pick the rumble part, remove that, but that still did leave the birds. They have I was it. happy about that. That's it. All right, good. Well, keep, keep your questions coming. Um, we do have a, uh, a, a whole lot of shows still to uh, to get through um, or to get to, I should say, because uh, what we're going to do um, after we take a quick little break is we are going to move on to our next section. We're going to talk about um, uh, AI and machine learning as a, as a greater topic and, and how we start to, um, you know, how we start to, to think about this as we're, we're moving forward not just in terms of video, but in terms of, uh, sorry, not just in terms of audio, but also in terms of video. Um, but before we get to that, I would love to give away some, some stuff. So I'm going to uh, awkwardly uh, just wait to see if the Tombola is ready. And do you know, what? I, can, I can actually hear, I can actually hear it spinning up. I mean, this is, this is amazing. So all we're going to do is I'm just going to go and have a little look and tell you what you could win. So we are still going to be giving away four one year subscriptions to Crumple Pop. So that's that's one one prize to, to four lucky winners, not four four things to one person, um, because that would be ridiculous. Uh, and we also have one prize of the Boris FX suite. So that is everything that we make. And we, you know, we'll give you Crumble Pop as well, but you will also get Sapphire, you'll get Continuum, you'll get Moga Pro, you'll get Silhouette. And of course, 
you'll get optics and that's going to one lucky winner we've already given away one prize today uh and that went out to dan do you know what he had to do he had to go to borisfxlive.com he scrolled down to the bottom of the page and all he did was tippy tap his details in there that was all it did it took him seconds and he's walking away with a one-year subscription of crumble pop and this could be you and it's absolutely going to be you if you're the next name that i read out as we roll the tombola we uh, we start beating those drums and i'm going to give away a one-year subscription to taylor tracy taylor tracy congratulations you are our second winner of the crumple pop one year subscription do we have another winner we do let's go let's spin that wheel again i'm spinning it i'm looking and we are going to be landing on our second our second winner of this show robin bell look at that robin congratulations you have won our one year subscription to crumple pop as well well done taylor well done robin uh, if you're in the chat give us a little shout give us a little wave um so we've given away three so far i'm going to give away one more in this little section so let's let's uh let's crank it up again let's go we're spinning the wheel and we have got another year subscription going to Albert Smith. Smith, congratulations, Albert. You are joining our legions of winners today uh, with Boris FX. Congratulations, Albert. You have won a one year subscription to Crumple Pop. Well done. Albert and all of our winners, don't worry. We will be in contact within the next day or two and to tell you how you can win your prize. But if you didn't win, don't worry, there is still time. Just go to borisfxlive.com and go to the bottom of the page and enter your details there. If you're enjoying the stream, don't forget to hit the thumbs up button. It helps us out a lot. We are joining the cargo cult of liking and subscribing with YouTube. So thank you very much. And also get your questions in. I am monitoring the chat as much as I possibly can. Uh, I will be taking a look at all of your questions and, uh, and asking as many as I possibly, possibly can. Uh, if you want to, of course, we have a free trial of uh, Crumble Pop, uh, and it's not just a free trial. You also get free stuff going with it as well. So if you pop over to crumplepop.com, uh, there is a starter pack which gives you the uh, the sound app basic, which is a, a standalone application that lets you sort of go in and uh, remove certain elements, including pop remover and rustle remover. And it gives you the trial of the other uh, the other ones as well. If you want to step it up and go uh, into the uh, fully pro plugins, of course, those are available either as a monthly or annual subscription or because we love you all a one-time perpetual license as well so you have the choice of what you want but yeah download it for free see what you think uh live it love it crumblepop.com slash price all right um cool excellent well shall we uh shall we move on a little bit i think we're gonna i think we're gonna change up the pace a little bit now uh, and we're going to talk pr about probably the, the most asked question of the last 12 months, at least 12 months, which is uh, AI and what Boris Fex is doing with it. Um, so to help us along with this, I am actually going to bring on another couple of people. I'm going to bring on JP Smith, who is uh, Imagineer System, uh, sorry, Imagineer System CEO uh, and one of the biggest brains that I know, uh, as well as the man whose name is, uh, is part of our logo. Uh, he is the Boris part of Boris Effects. Uh, Boris Yamnitsky, uh, welcome both of you to the stream. Hi everyone, great to be here. Yeah, thanks, thanks for uh, thanks for being here. It's uh, you know, it's 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 actually it's been probably about a year since we last did our uh, our, our last sort of machine learning uh, live stream, and. I think it's safe to say that a lot of things have uh, have changed. Um, I think, like the first the first question I'm going to ask to uh, to you, Boris, which is, 
if you can just talk a little bit about the history of AI and, and machine learning at, at Boris Effect. Oh, with pleasure. Yeah, thanks, Ben. Good to be here and good to talk to everyone who joined us today. So um, I'll actually start even a little earlier. I've been interested in uh, machine learning and uh, AI uh, for many years. Uh, um, while I, I was a student, I was a graduate student at uh, computer science. Uh, and uh, at the time, that was in the 80s, at the time, there was uh, I've heard about neural networks. I've heard about oh, you know some research that was going, but it was really it all really sounded so futuristic and so impractical that I never really personally got involved. Um, and even like thinking about the history of uh, AI and machine learning all the way back when it started, it started in the 1956 at some seminar in Dartmouth College. Uh, where they started to uh, think about how to teach machine to think and uh, how to uh, make artificial intelligence that was just kind of budding and you know, becoming becoming interesting to researchers. And I hope these people are actually still alive thinking about that they were doing research in 1956. And uh, yeah, this is when uh, British government and American government started to put a lot of money into AI because they thought that it's the technology and it, that would be, you know, winning uh, and that would be very important for for the defense and for you know for the success of uh, the the companies and the industries. So for the next ten years, uh, many many millions were poured in into AI without much result because obviously the first computers that were there in the 50s and the 60s were nowhere you know capable people realized how much computing is actually necessary uh, to make something useful out of ai and then in i think in 1976 uh both british and american governments stopped sort of wasting money on ai and uh, what started was uh, what's called uh, AI winter. So for the next 20 or so years, there was pretty much no money going into AI research. And uh, there was some people interested in academia and some papers were published, uh, more specifically you know, uh, on neural networks. But there was nothing really practical coming out of that until the early 2000s. And in the early 2000s, the, with the rise of uh, GPU, the graphics hardware, which is highly multi-processed and actually capable of dealing with uh, computations necessary for neural networks. Uh, specifically, uh, there's something called convolutional neural networks, which is an implementation of uh, neural networks that basically is algebra, it's number crunching matrices. So uh, it requires massive particle computation. And at that point, the first GPUs have become more capable of dealing with crunching a lot of numbers and you know, dealing with a lot of matrices. And this is when sort of that AI winter ended. And again, more money has come into AI and more uh, people have gotten interested, mo obviously, mostly in academia. So, and I mean, we've been watching all that process with interest, but without any uh, practical intentions until maybe some five years ago or so, uh, when, again, the multi-threaded and multi-processing uh, computing power has uh, come to the point where um, you know, the relatively inexpensive or mid mid priced computing computers um, were able to solve uh, the necessary uh, the necessary math and do the necessary computations. So this is where we first uh, started. You know, our lo looking our first project, our looking into machine learning at Boris Effects uh, as a pilot project. Again, at the time. The problem was it was 
was showing very interesting results. And we were doing mostly, you know, image restoration type uh, tasks. Uh, very interesting results, but we, what we realized is, again, someone really needs to put together a very beefy uh, workstation with, uh, you know, very expensive, you know, multi-thousand dollar uh, NVIDIA graphics cards to, again, making something uh, practical. And even that practical was not what people would expect. The practical was, okay, you know, a frame will take, um, a video frame will take, I don't know, 30 seconds to uh, process. And again, people at the time, even five years ago, people were not used to that kind of performance. And again, let's keep in mind that our uh, goal was to put AI in a plugin put AI in something that can actually run you know, on your desktop or hopefully even on a laptop. It, our platforms were typically Adobe Premiere, Avid, um, you know, the After Effects, you know, analysts of uh, the choice of, for our customers. And they were all run on regular desktop computers. So um, you see now that there was more success, uh, observable success of AI in the cloud. And so you ask yourself, so why is it all in the cloud? And the reason is because there could be many more resources available in the cloud. You can put in you know, uh, farms of machines and you, know, you, you upload your video, you upload your audio, you process everything on some you know, AWS computer with a lot of GPU power on it and then you can get the results, but can you really get it on your desktop? This is very uh, recent. And this is what why I was actually so excited uh, when I first uh, met and looked at the Crumple Pop products and met the team that they were able to execute AI in real time as they play audio. Of course, you know, audio is smaller than video, so the task is somewhat more achievable. Uh, and with video, again, the challenge is, uh, you know, as the computers become faster, the size of images become larger. So, you know, we've been looking at HD and then we're looking at 2K, 4K, now 8K, which is kind of, you know, standard. All Netflix productions are done in, like, you know, 6K, 8K. Uh, and uh, that, that, that's a challenge. But with audio, it's a little bit more achievable, but still very, very impressive. The fact that you can just pre press a button and remove wind, remove any kind of noise uh, in real time. So keep in mind that you, for each you know, like duration of you know, uh, piece of audio that you need to process, uh, you have about 1 30th of a second, maybe less. So it's an instant that is even like, you know, hard to sense, uh, but that's how fast it has to be. So uh, as we continue our development uh, in, you know, in, in the AI, in, in the, we will we'll, we'll, we'll definitely have more technology now working uh, in like, in, you know, in, in internally and I'm just I'm just so excited to start working with uh, the Crumple Pop uh, technical team and uh, kind of like you know exchange ideas, uh, compare results, uh, you know leverage each other's experience uh, in that area. Well, I just I just want to turn a little bit to uh, to JP for this because, like. I think, like as Boris was saying, like there's been this this ex explosion of research and development in that machine learning AI field, um, and, and we're seeing results that actually today that would have been unthinkable just a few years ago. I mean, is it is it only the uh, the the progression of, of of hardware that's been driving this, or has there been other other forces in motion that you've seen? I think um, it, it's interesting that Boris talked through the it's kind of the full history of, um, of AI there. But and just going back to that time when um, things started to get interesting again, um, I guess around about 15 years ago, that's that kind of time, uh, maybe a bit less. Um, it was a real resurgence in computer vision, actually. Um, and I think 
yeah, there were problems that people had been thinking about and trying to solve for a long time all of a sudden became accessible. And yeah, I think the, the availability of the hardware was a key thing, but that then inspired lots more research in the area. Um, you know, a lot of problems that people had just parked as too difficult. All of a sudden they thought, well, okay, maybe that's not too difficult if we take this new approach. Um, and, and that's what we've certainly seen with problems in computer vision that people would consider never never could really be solved like really detailed image segmentation for instance now becomes um more feasible just because that 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 kind of catalyst of the of the uh, hardware availability the ability to actually do these um massive neural networks um then you know catalyze the the extra research i mean I, like but do you think then that there's there's going to be like a um like a, a a bigger push from from hardware manufacturers now to to develop something that's that's actually you know a bit more useful as as opposed to the the sort of crypto nft horror show that we've <laughs> you know been subjected to for the last half decade or so um you know it, it, is that going to be the, the next big push to 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 help to to bring these uh you know these these algorithms into into the home well, I, I certainly hope so. Um, you know, we we talk a lot with the um, GPU manufacturers, and obviously they are investing heavily in the ability to um, pro run AI models um, on our desktop machines as well as in the cloud. Um, so, yeah, hopefully, hopefully, we will see that some of these, you know, obviously, crumple pop stuff is real time. Um, some more complex models still take time to run on on uh, desktop machines, but I'm hopeful that we'll get to the point where these things can run as quickly as as traditional algorithms did. Sorry, go. For it. Yeah, yeah, I was just going to add to what GP said. You know, what's interesting to observe is that um, machine learning frameworks have become parts of retail standard operating systems which were not exactly you know the case let's say five years ago so apple and uh, microsoft uh, they are adding machine learning tools or frameworks they become uh, part of the part of the operating system that you already install on your computer so that helps us avoid multi-gigabyte uh, downloads and installation of uh, very complex uh, software that you know, otherwise we would need in order to talk to the hardware, in order to talk to the GPU uh, hardware. So, yeah, along with the uh, hardware progress, there is also software progress. And, uh, of course, the uh, those frameworks that we all use in order to execute uh, machine learning uh, systems uh, they're becoming, again, more advanced and more optimized. It's all about optimization, you see. Uh, you can try to solve or, uh, you know, write inference on a very complex model, uh, like basically in a straightforward fashion, you know, having to like in simple layman terms, multiply every, you know, matrix by every matrix, right? Or you can optimize it further, just you know, try to find the smartest way or the most optimal way in that computation path. And uh, so there is a lot of definitely a lot of research going on now in software as well as hardware. Yeah, and just coming back to that, I, I think we really are starting to benefit from the um, consumer device AI developments. The fact that you know Apple put neural network processors in an iPhone and then run run these um, run this inference on a device and then make the you know the level of optimization they have to do in the software to actually be able to do that that also then applies to the desktop machines um, where the same software stack is running um, and yeah you know not just Apple some of the other companies are working on that, that kind of thing as well and that that, that level of integration definitely um, helps the work that we're doing. Yeah. I mean, take taking it so over to the the crumple pop yeah. guys for for just a just a moment though, because uh, like you you made a uh, you know a, a very a, ch a choice to to actually make sure that that your 
AI audio plugins were running on a on a local machine. Uh, was was that um, you know was that driven by the practicalities of being able to, or or is there a you know a, an advantage for being able to run these in a in a sort of closed off network? Yeah, the um, I mean. We, we experimented with both really. Uh, early on, we looked at processing in the cloud and seeing if we could work that into the workflow. And uh, it was this really tricky trade-off between quality and performance that you have, like Boris said, you have immense resources you can throw at it when it's in the cloud. But the user experience, especially in the context of an audio plugin, you know, you, you, when you're in it at NLE, using a plugin, you want fast results. That's so important for making it feel uh, good and, and have a good workflow. So we, we actually went from um, an idea of processing the cloud to like, oh, we can, uh, we can do this locally. You know, if we can possibly pull this off and, and run this on the desktop, it would be such a boost to the overall experience um, and usability of this kind of a product that uh, I mean, it was very difficult, you know? And so we, but that's eventually what we got to. And, and, and we're very happy with the fact that not only does it run in real time, but you can stack several of these plugins and they'll still, you know, multiple instances will still run in real time, which is uh, very important for having a smooth workflow and just a pleasant experience when you're working with a project. Uh, so that was, yeah, we, we really saw it as, you know, with, with uh, working with AI, there, there were two big challenges and people focus on the first one, which is coming up with a, um, something that produces a good result, you know, and, and, and removes wind or fixes a problem that was impossible before. But there's a second challenge that's also extremely difficult, which is, um, again, that, you know, Boris touched on which is deploying this in a, in a commercial environment, in an environment where people have no patience for, uh, you know, rendering and sitting back and waiting. Is it, that's really not acceptable. So those were two, the two big challenges we had to, to face in, in bringing these tools to market was um, having something that, that was really good and that would uh, run fast and locally and could be uh, deployed in that way. So that was, uh, that was, I mean, it's been, you know, a long, a long development path. Uh, one thing I would mention is, is kind of funny. Um, we experienced this thing years back when we got into the, the process of developing AI where uh, we would, you know, do all this work and then get a, get a result and then test it. And sometimes the result was, you know, often it wouldn't work. It'd be terrible, you know, and so on. And then we would get something that was really good to the point where it was actually a little bit weird. And we would kind of just be like, oh, that's kind of weird that it can do that, you know, because you never quite know, like, it, it, it's a little bit of a, an art to figuring out, you know, what's going to pop out of the, of the, uh, the process. And that feeling which we've had for years now of like when it goes well it's like a slightly strange is now like everybody in the world is experiencing this uh, in the last few months as we've seen this big explosion of ai stuff it's like you see these results and it's like oh how did it do that that's kind of weird and so it's uh that's we've in our own little little world we've been experiencing that for a long time now and it's interesting to see it now become uh just a, a mainstream thing that everybody's starting to see I mean, opening up a, a, that that topic up a little bit, then, because we can. I mean, I suppose we could we could talk about the ethics of AI in a diffuse way, and you know, there's probably been a little bit too much uh, of of pearl clutching already about the the present state of of AI and what it means for our eventual capitulation to our robot overlords. Um, but I think that seems a little bit less than productive. Um, so, in in terms of of the challenges we face in the post-production world. I mean, wh where do you think this machine learning approach is, is going to be, um, you know, is, is, is going to be best suited for? Where are we going to see like the, the big inroads uh, in, in the coming months and years? 
Well, I mean, you know, that's that's what we've I guess we've been doing that in our in our area, which is which is we identified this specific uh, area of audio restoration, fixing, uh, you know, improving audio, and that's that's uh, that but that's just one small area, right? And like Boris mentioned, audio lends itself to this uh, because there's. Uh, you know, there's basically less bandwidth requirements. Uh, it, it's 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 more approachable if you're trying to deliver something real time. Uh, where this will go beyond audio restoration, uh, it's I mean, it's anybody's guess. It seems like uh, it could have many applications within the Boris Effects products and. I don't want to get go go too too <laughs> off on a limb there and start talking about that, but I mean. I don't know. I, I, I guess the short, for me, the short answer is it's going to, it's going to touch a, a very wide range of, of things in post-production and it already is. Well, let, let's, I mean, and it is, let's, let's, let's turn this to, uh, to Boris then. I mean, where, where do you, where do you see the, uh, you know, the, the challenges that we, that we face and, and how we can start to, you know, a, a, approach those from, from this different this different perspective yeah sure yeah first of first of all i just want to say that i'm super excited about ai in general um i, I really like i remember as a kid you know reading reading isaac asimov for uh, i robot stories right and you know raising all those ethical problems of uh, what's going to happen when there are robots around and what if, you know, robots take over the world and, and, but it was interesting, those who read the stories, what was the year of, of, you know, what's the, what was the target year? It was 2000s. Hmm. So it's like 20 years ago, we would have all these robots that, you know, walk around the house, do the chores for us, drive us around do the gardening, like everything that, you know, Isaac Asimov was uh, foreseeing, right? They're not here. So it was a big disappointment. Actually, for me, for me it was a big disappointment. <laughs> I think, I think that uh, definitely AI now looks like a watershed moment um, in definitely in media and entertainment business, uh, media uh, industry. We definitely are seeing that AI is making possible things that are not were not quite possible before with the speed and with the automation that were not quite possible before. So, uh, and the media and the entertainment space has been growing so fast and so much, you know, starting with pre-pandemic uh, years and going into COVID years. So it, there's an explosion of media. Right, and uh, is an explore is the need the market demand for media is growing so fast it's really outpacing uh, the, the ability of uh, the the industry to produce. So uh, it's going to be definitely as 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 with any disruptive technology, there'll be winners, there'll be losers, there'll be uh, people who do different things now, people who uh, do things differently. But that's good because. That's the progress. That's what defines the progress of uh, mankind, uh, the way I see it. And uh, we are definitely going to see much more powerful systems that would do things very fast and uh, would, you know, less expensive, but uh, in a much more, you know, profound way. It you know, goes for, you know, audio restoration, uh, image restoration, generative uh, AI. Uh, it like, almost like reminds me of my own experience uh, in the 90s with uh, nonlinear video editing systems, which they just, they just appeared in early, you know, 1990s, uh, like Avid and Media 100 and uh, Division and, you know, those who still remember those names. But what basically what happened is uh, individual people were empowered to produce so much more, so cheaply and so quickly. People were, you know, made, you know starting businesses, uh, video editing businesses in their bedrooms because the technology 
enabled them to do so. They were actually, let's say, you know, putting mortgages on their houses and buying a Avid or Media 100 system for $50,000. And guess what? They're in business of, of making local TV commercials. So what I'm, what I'm saying is uh, I, I predict that um, AI will make just as, as dramatic impact on the media and entertainment space now where people will be able to produce more uh, faster and a much higher quality product than uh, you know they were able uh, without AI and uh, that's you know that that's actually very exciting this is very um, you know very 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 interesting to think about and I'm I'm I'm, I'm super super happy to be a part of that uh, you know revolution that technological uh, revolution that we're seeing now well let's let's i'm gonna uh this one's for 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 jed then um because i, I want to talk a little bit about like uh the sort of the process of of building these models that are actually you know doing doing the particular tasks that you're asking it to uh to do um and and coming from you know coming from someone who's been on the the, the sharp end of that uh like how how do you protect against biases in in the model that that maybe come from from biases in the uh, in the training data as well? Yeah, so sort of um, something Boris touched on too, just kind of thinking forward in general about or like you know the ethics of AI overall. I think that it's important personifying it is like in an Asimov way is is an easy way to understand. You know, like this computer is very smart and it did this task. Good job that's amazing it's like a human but instead of that i think thinking of them like they are what they are to me is like a tool it, it helps you you know we have cars that can mostly drive us but you should look with your eyes and and pay attention to the road too you know and that's that's where we're at you know as to say where we'll be in the future but so in our tools the reason i bring that up is in our tools there's going to be an aspect um where the human element uh you know our team uh, are going to steer where the AI goes. So, you know, when it comes to that, it, data is an important part. And like, you know, like you said, biases in the data set, you know, where you have to obviously consider that, Um, you know, when you're training something for humans and like what voices you're including and, you know, and such. But those are obvious um, biases. The, the unobvious biases and the things to look out for, um, show up in, in ways where like Gabe was talking about earlier, where maybe you get something and you try it um, and um, it doesn't work. And we're always looking for, for those out there. And it's, you know, being doing this for many years and making audio tools. Now we've, we get this wide variety of voices and people coming in. So maybe there's a certain, you know, for example, we may be really missing the bird voice bias. We were biased against birds and, there may actually be a use case where you want to have more noise removal um, to say, you know, it, it more voice data of birds, it, for example. And I use that just because it came up today, but there are other specific examples. And I guess what I'm trying to say overall is that instead of it being an AI that is our overlord or our underling or some personification, it's a tool we're shaping over time, all of us in some ways on the macro level society together, but specifically our tools that we're training to kind of make sure we're covering any blind spots um, in, in, in the world. And I think we've done a very good job so far of, of casting a wide net of stuff and uh, for lack of a better term stuff, uh, meaning like all of <laughs> recorded audio that exists um, that people work on. And uh yeah, and I guess to answer your question, I, I hope that kind of answered your question. We've kind of meandered around there, but uh, the bias is something that is ever something to look out for. You're not just letting the car drive and, you know, there it is. You you have to be ever vigilant to look for those blind mm -hmm. spots and help adjust. And that's one thing that's fun, I think, about AI is that it's growing. So you can always be, you know, it reiterating and, and fine tuning um, our tools. But it's, I mean, it's also uh, probably important to reiterate that the there is an understanding 
of of bias as well um and that you know that that is something that you know to to be to be vigilant for yeah um, to, to to make the tools better at, at, at the end of the day isn't it really yeah i mean and i think bias in that way is like a you know it's i think it's important to look at it as like a, a momentary like it's like your vision like you, what are you literally looking at you know it, it's shiftable like you may have bias and then in trying to correct that bias you may shift this way and miss another bias. you know so you need to make sure you're ever vigilant it's an ongoing um I don't know sharpening of the tool to mm -hmm. to keep it um as uh unbiased and as as um you know widely working as best as possible. I like I've I've got a question from from chat now which um I'm going to uh give to JP. Um like we this is like how how do you see AI or machine learning being far different from any other algorithm which gets smarter? as more inf information is collected. Uh, are all algorithms intelligent in that way? I think that's that's the key difference between AI and traditional like classical approaches. You know, some algorithm that we might have for say motion tracking in Mocha, it, when we ship that product, it works in a certain way. If we want to make it work better, we need to go back to the, you know, the origins of the mathematics and come up with new solutions or something. Whereas an AI, we, we simply give it more examples of what it's supposed to be doing and it learns to get better. Yeah. So this, this I think is the, is the key difference. It's um, yeah, the, improving some of these like classical algorithms, you hit a point and you really can't go any further. Um, whereas the AI approach, yeah, there's always the opportunity as Jack was saying, you can carry on refining. You find out that your AI doesn't really work in a particular scenario where well, you can gather more training examples and train it on that and it will get better or you know it's highly likely to get better at handling that particular case so yeah there's a fundamental difference in, from, from my perspective between those those two approaches well, does that mean then that the you know the traditional approach uh, to, to handling these problems is is now is now finished you know there's 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 no use, uh, you know, exploring those ideas or or that, you know, that that sort of element uh, anymore. Or, you know, is there still a lot of uh, of, of research and and uh, you know development to be uh, to be gained from actually coming in and and using those those other traditional approaches as well, the, those yeah. regular mathematical there, approaches. Um, there's certain areas that we we haven't seen anything yet um, on the AI research side that comes close or, you know, it is a viable replacement for some of the classical algorithms. I mean, a good example is um, 3D camera tracking. 3, 3D camera tracking, like SLAM, this kind of approach is very well understood um, and continuing to develop, you know, the, the um, classical computer vision approaches, really. Bits of AI are starting to come into that. For example, you might at the start of that process, you need to detect features in the scene and track them from one frame to another. So maybe you start to use AI to do that part of it. But overall, it's still fundamental. It's like a it's a sort of more classic approach. Um, now, maybe in time, people will devise ways to to represent problems like that for AI to solve in a reasonable at a reasonable speed. Um, but for now. That, you know, there's nothing that can compete with the speed of like slam algorithms um, for for motion for 3D motion tracking um, on the AI side. But yeah, some problems. Um, it's clear that you know no one would consider using a non-AI approach anymore. I, I think that's the case. You know, there's cer certain, especially many of the sort of restoration type approaches uh, or alg uh, problems upresing or this kind of thing. Um, it's hard to imagine that that people would go back to trying to come up with a traditional filter based approach to this instead of using uh, AI. Oh, and of, of course, there are um, you know there are, there are certain industries that can't use uh, you know the, the the AI approaches um, because they need to to have um, you know forensic trackability of of the of the stream as it goes through. I mean, actually, literally with in terms of 
uh, law enforcement and video forensics. They need literal, you know, forensic uh, trackability, and that's maybe that's something that's a little bit trickier to to do with with AI when there is a, a certain amount of um, you know hidden black box processing that's that's going on yeah. in there. I think one um, challenge is um, the difference between something that really extracts the true signal that's there versus something which actually fills in the gaps with a hallucination. Um, mm. And yeah, you look at some examples of maybe um, an upscaling or an in-painting or something like that. And yeah, what it's actually done is it's hallucinated the additional detail and it's plausible, but it, it wasn't there in the original image. Mm. Um, you know, and you could compare something like um, in Mocha, we have the object removal tool and the remove module, and that literally copies pixels from other frames in the, in the video. So the, all the pixels in the output were somewhere in the input, but an AI in paint may simply, based on the treat like the, the rest of the frame as a prompt and then generate, like hallucinate something to fill in that gap. And yeah, if you're in a situation where you you can't you can't deal with something like that for legal reasons, for example. Then yeah, it's not appropriate. I mean, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask this to uh, to to uh, Pat then. Um, does this signal the end of the artist? <laughs> like this is this is a really easy easy question for you. <laughs> like, I don't think so. No. <laughs> I, th I think it's still, uh, at least for where we're at now, there's still, like, even if you just look at what people are pulling from prompts, someone still has to put that prompt in. And I think it's great at solving problems, but the idea of it, at least generative, uh, generative AI, creating something that like, speaks to us or anything like that, sure, that's possible. But at this point... I can see it more as a tool to help someone's creativity than taking away from someone's creativity. Well, I mean, Gabe, then, um, where, where's, what does the user get out of this, um, you know, this, this approach as a whole? Is, is this a, a leveling technology that means that anyone with a plugin can create the same effects that the pros used to spend a lot of time on? Well, we, we hope that it actually goes a step beyond that and that um, in the case of um, Crumple Pop, you know, audio tools, that it, it doesn't replace the pro, but it gives the pro a tool that uh, lets them do something that was impossible before and that that's open to, you know, the pro, the, the um, prosumer, you know, every, every, Tier. And that's, that's what's really exciting is, is the idea that um, it's, it's not just a kind of factoring people out of the equation. It's putting a more powerful tool in their hand. And, and like Pat said, it's, it's, um, it, it amplifies what, what people can do ideally, right? And so that, and, but I think that becomes a, a decision we have to make, um, you know, at, at Boris effects as we go forward and bring new uh, AI tools to our users, what's kind of, what's the goal? What's the, you know, what are we, what are we doing? And, and it's, um, it's a really interesting question. It's very, it's very open right now. You know, are, are, are we, uh, I, I, the most exciting potential I think is, is to uh, that it, enables people to do more uh but that requires then a rethink too of like what um you know like pat was saying like is our prompts part of what the artist is going to be about now you know like be, is that just a thing you learn now yeah maybe um and i, I think that it very much applies to the world of audio tools is uh, you know what does it mean that people can uh that you can have a, a very humble uh, home studio now that maybe you can't treat acoustically, um, but now you can very easily remove the reverb and make it sound pretty good. You know what? What does that? What does that mean? I, I think that's um, 
it's cool. It's, it, it makes new things possible and it, and it, it creates new opportunities for people. So I, I don't know. That's, I think that's where our excitement is with this. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's always room for the artist. Yeah. I, no, I, I just like this uh, gave, uh, you know, put it very well, uh, you know, that we basically, yeah, we're empowering uh, people to do more uh, and individual people, startup people, people who are starting their own businesses, we're empowering them to do mo more with the resources, with like, small resources that they have, uh, working from home. So, uh, you know, with very inexpensive equipment, uh, maybe not the best of breed equipment, like, you know, maybe even, you know, a lesser microphone can be used to, uh, you know, record, record something outdoors and uh, achieve professional results. So uh, it's like in, in the end, to me, it's making people happy, uh, making customers happy and making customers actually impressed by what we sell to them. That's, that's the you know, highest reward that I see in my professional life. And I think AI helps me to achieve that reward, really. Yeah, yeah I think, think the, 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 always the most rewarding part of, um, uh, of, of my job as well is, is seeing what people are doing with the tools. Like, because I, I, I'm in a, a very privileged position to be able to, uh, to work and, and help to, to sort of guide how some of these uh, tools are, are you know, developed uh, and created. And then I, I get to see very, very smart people put some of my ideas into, uh, you know, in, into a piece of software. Um, and then very smart people take that piece of software and then create something absolutely fantastic that, that I, I really couldn't have, uh, you know, imagined doing with it, um, before. And I think that that's something that's always very, um, yeah, I think so, uh, some, something that's always very humbling is that like, whatever the, the tool that they're using, it's always the artist's voice that comes out, um, uh, the other end of it, you know, and, and I've seen that with generative AI tools as well. Uh, when I think one of the things we were talking about when we, we, we were talking about, uh, uh, mid journey and stable diffusion uh, a year ago was the fact that uh, people given the same the same prompts and the same ideas were always getting out something that that actually spoke a little bit more about their character than just the just the raw prompts because there was an act of of crafting uh, and and sort of um, choosing and and, and culling ideas that didn't fit with their with their aesthetic or with you know with with their um with their mood at the time so you know no matter what the tool is uh, at the end of it the the there is someone behind the keyboard and mouse who is helping to shape uh you know what what the the final result is and that final result is you know you something that that uh, that, that speaks from them and speaks about them I've I've got time for just a, a few more questions. I've I've actually just seen what the uh, what, what the time is. So we've we've got time for some some little questions and some big questions as well. Um I'm I'm gonna start off with a with a little question, uh, which I think is always a bit funny. Uh, who picked the name Crumple Pop? Oh man. Um so after we uh after we started uh Crumple Pop uh you know, you know right at the very beginning i i told my friend ed hey we're starting this thing it's called crumble pop and he said oh was every other web domain taken <laughs> uh which is which is you know it's kind of hard to understand in here but the the short answer is uh uh when we were just starting out our, our very first product was a, a lower thirds pack that used a, a kind of a uh, crumpled paper style. And we didn't know if we would do anything beyond that. We thought maybe that, you know, that would be the first and last thing we did. So we just called it crumple pop because that sounded cool. Um, by it, immense good fortune, it winds up to be a pretty good name for an audio 
uh, product also. So it just kind of worked out, but that's, that's the history to that name. Serendipity. There we go. Um, okay. I've got, I've got one, one more, uh, one more one about, uh, the, the audio, uh, that we were showing earlier. Um, if you have an area with people talking in the background, can the background people audio be removed? Is that part of the, uh, uh, is that part of the training? So I would say that the best tool at that job would be traffic remover. Um, but I would say that in all things audio, it's going to depend on some mic placement and some, you know, there's levels to that. Like, like how close are the people? How well was the person mic? You know, so I'm not going to say, yes, we can always do that. Uh, but I would say that uh, traffic remover is probably your best bet at that. Audio denoise can also help. And um, even echo remover can help um, with that. Uh, but yeah, um, it can, it, that, like all things, there are levels to this. Uh, my favorite example of an extreme is someone once sent me a video where they'd interviewed someone standing in front of a literal jet engine. And they said, uh, can you help remove this noise? We did all right. Uh, but you know, if there's a jet engine level of a uh, person talking <laughs> behind the person in the cafe you're interviewing, I'm not sure we can remove the jet engine human, but, um, <laughs> But yeah, traffic remover can sometimes help with that. Uh, it's something, it's a specific, if there's a specific need for a tool like that, um, th that's the kind of stuff I like hearing from the audience in general. Like, uh, you know, are there other, what are the pain points of audio? Like what, kind of like we were talking about bias earlier, you know, if maybe we just haven't heard enough about a certain pain points, um, you know, bird recording, uh, let's, you know, we could, we can do these things. It's a, it's a fluid world, so. Well, this also seems like a, a great time to uh, to plug both the the Boris FX forums, uh, forum .boris .fx .com, uh and the Boris FX Discord as a uh, as a great place to um, you know be able to to talk about these things and and suggest uh, you know the pain points that that you're you're having at any certain time. Um, you know those those places are are actively monitored and you know definitely uh, you know definitely help help out uh where we can yeah and example clips love to see example clips here yeah. example clips you know we go <laughs> um okay i've got got one one final audio question then one big end question uh what about loud clicks and pops from bad lav or head mic cables is there a combo pop tool that can help with that loud clicks and pops Sounds like a sounds like there's something. Yeah. Um. So Russell Remover is uh trained for I would just say generally speaking like a lav mic type issues. So if if Russell Remover doesn't outright move it, Pop Remover should be able to help you. Pop Remover, a sort of secret feature of Pop Remover, is that it can actually help with some what people call handling noise, which is um you know this kind of this kind of thing and uh you know bumps on the table and that sort of thing so so pop remover and rustle remover are going to be your friend for any kind of um uh clicks pops and lav mic pain that audio engineers and people know excellent all right okay final final question this one is also from chat i want to say thank you very much to uh to everyone who's asked uh, your question in chat today um and this one is for 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 Boris. Um, like, how do you envision the emerging uses of AI in Boris FX products? And do you have a timeline for doing so? You know, what what is the vision for for AI? All right. So I I'll answer the second question first. Uh, the timeline twenty twenty three. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And. Uh, yeah, definitely. I I see uh, AI uh, playing increasing roles, and um, you know, voice effects tools have been used for uh, image restoration and for uh, video restoration and cleanup for uh, you know for many generations of uh, NLE systems and uh, many generations of video editors use them. Uh, definitely, there is a big potential there, uh, and this uh, this 
tools are just about to come out. Uh, and secondly, you see, there is this creative process uh, in VFX and in editing that uh, is basically experimentation. You see, all right, you know, you throw a transition. No, it doesn't, you know, look so good on this uh, to like outgoing and incoming clip. Let me try that transition. So, uh, or visual effects. So there's, a lot, there's some experimentation that goes on. So I believe that AI will help, uh, you know, make this experimentation faster and easier and maybe uh, more creative. There may be uh, interesting effects or choices that you would not think about uh you know when when you start start that project but it may just like you know dawn on you oh okay you know this this actually looks cool and i did not think about it myself but you know the computer did so but you see but this is where i personally think that there's a is a big role of uh you know of artists that, that of humans uh, in this whole process and that is we are as humans are final judges of the outcome so we can experiment we can give prompts but then we have a power to reject right okay yeah this is hallucination or this is something ah, it's, it's not really interesting right visually interesting or you know uh, so yeah we'll you know we'll move on we'll do something else uh so this power of experimentation i think is uh you know will be opened up by more ai tools and uh, i'm not gonna exactly say you know which which features <laughs> will be, yeah which uh yeah which products will get the most uh, ai love uh first but they'll definitely be uh we'll be talking more about ai this year Yep. Yeah. 20, 2023 is going to be a, a a very, very exciting year. Um, I would also like to to take this time to uh to plug our upcoming NAB preview, uh, which is happening uh next week. So we're gonna have a live stream. If you can't make it down to uh or over to Vegas, then uh then join us on the uh the, the live stream on uh, Wednesday the eight nineteenth. Wednesday the something, Wednesday the 19th. Um, join us there. Uh, and, and, and maybe, maybe something will, uh, will, will pique your interest there. All right. I want to say thank you very much to, uh, to all of our guests for, for joining us today. Um, we are, yeah, we're, we're, we're going to just uh, give away some more stuff. So maybe everyone wants to hang around for the, uh, for the stuff giving. Um, and then we'll, we'll say a proper goodbye afterwards. All righty. Um, okay, so we've, we've got a, uh, another couple of things to, uh, to give away. But if you've been enjoying what you've, you've heard so far, it's this thing that I'm going to ask for. This a little thumbs up on the, uh, the YouTube stream. Um, it, it really is a, a, a great help for us if you do that. If you're not liking the stuff, you know, we've got that as well. You know, I'm not as big a fan of that as that but that's that's always a good one uh and of course if you want to uh be first with all of the knowledge of stuff as we uh as we release it uh including training materials or you know new products that are happening you definitely want to subscribe to our youtube channel as well all righty but if you're watching on borisfxlive.com you'll have been tempted to go down and join in the competition i know you have and it's now time to see whether that temptation has paid off we have given away four annual subscriptions to crumble pop already i have one more to give away plus one one year subscription to the boris effect suite which is everything so let's start with the crumble pop i'm going to roll the tombola we're going to see we're going to pull out a name and it is going to be my favorite, Jonathan St. John. Jonathan St. John. Jonathan St. John. Uh, congratulations. You have won a one year subscription to Crumple Pop. Congratulations, Jonathan. Well done. Well done to you. All right. You are joining our other lucky winners, but we're not done yet. 
we are still giving away a copy of the Boris Effect Suite. Everything that we make, give you Crumble Pop, we'll give you Sapphire, we'll give you Mocha Pro, Continuum, of course, Silhouette and Optics. It's going to one lucky winner, and that lucky winner is going to be Crumble Pop. I remember, of course, Crumble Pop is not part of the suite, uh, which I've said uh, yet. Um, it's brand new. Literally, literally Monday, we came out with this. So Crumble Pop, not part of the Boris Effect suite. Um, but we are still giving away the suite to one lucky winner. And that lucky person is... Digga, 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 dum. It's your friend and it's my friend. It is Dan Svoboda. Dan Svoboda, congratulations, Dan. You are one of the illustrious few who have won on the Boris Effects live channel. Congratulations, Dan. Congratulations, Jonathan. Congratulations to all of our winners today. All they had to do was go to BorisFXLive.com and sign in. That was it. Um, but don't worry, if you haven't won today, everyone is a winner if you head over to TrumplePop.com because you can grab a free trial version of Crumple Pop right now today. You get the starter pack which has got the sound app basic. It's got pop remover. It's got Russell remover all for free, all for you, crumplepop.com. And also if you want to, uh, to go in and upgrade to pro, which is everything, all of the ones that we've seen today, we've got 25% off for you. All you have to do is use the coupon code Boris effects, 25% off a single product purchase. Use that coupon code. Boris effects, all one word. Alrighty, I want to say thank you very much to all of our guests. I want to say thank you to Pat Donahoe. I want to say thank you to Jed Smintek. I want to say thank you, of course, to Gabe Chaffetz. I got your name right this time, didn't I, Gabe? Oh, yes, thank you. Uh, of course, JP Smith and Boris as well. Uh, thank you, everyone, for, for joining us. And thank you all to our viewers. Um, we do appreciate you joining us for these, uh, for these live streams, and I hope that you enjoy them as much as we do. All right, as I said, stay tuned uh, at BorisFXLive.com, and you'll find out where the next streams are. Uh, we've got our NAB sneak preview of some of the stuff that is coming out this year happening next Wednesday. So that's Wednesday, the 19th of April. Uh, if you're watching this on replay, you might already be seeing into the future. All right, but thank you very much uh, from me. My name is Ben Brownlee. I wanna say thank you to Mission Control as well. And I will see you again in our next Boris FX Live live stream. Bye for now. <laughs>